In this section, we'll talk about how to solve polynomial equations. Uh, before we get started, learning objectives are to find solutions of polynomial equations and zeros of polynomial functions. Now, vocabulary-wise, some of these things are going to be interchangeable. So anytime you're asked to find solutions to equations that are polynomial in nature, you can also be asked to find zeros of the functions, the roots of the functions, or the x-intercepts of the function. All of these can be used interchangeably, so you should be on the lookout for if the question says, hey, find the zeros of this polynomial, or find the zeros of this function, or find the roots of this function, or find the x-intercepts of this function, they're asking you to do the exact same thing. Nothing changes, you use the same zero product property which we're about to talk about, and you solve the problems the exact same way. So before we get started, the almighty ZPP needs to be understood very, very, very well. The zero product property states that if you have something being multiplied by something else, and I'm being vague here on purpose, because this something doesn't have to always be a binomial. It could be a trinomial, it could be a monomial, it could be a, a polynomial times another polynomial. The idea is if you have two factors being multiplied and the answer is zero, then either the first one has to be zero, so either factor one has to equal zero or factor two has to equal zero or both factor one and factor two have to be zero. There's a property that only zero has in that you cannot multiply non-zero numbers and get zero as the answer. So pause, make sure you think about this deeply and convince yourself that if you're multiplying two quantities and you're getting zero as the answer, one of them has to be zero. You have no idea which one, but one of them at the very least must be zero. Now it's possible that both of them are zero and that's perfectly okay. And, and we'll in fact work with that as the assumption. Also, this does not it, it restrict itself to just two factors. If you have three factors, the zero product property still applies. It just gets cumbersome to write out three factors, but the idea is still the same. If you're multiplying three or four or 17 quantities and you're getting zero as the answer, one of them has to be zero. There's no choice in the matter. This is not true of any other number. So if you, for instance, had, um, let's say some quantity times another quantity equals seven. One of these doesn't have to be seven. This could be seven halves and two. If you multiply seven halves by two, you're going to get seven. And similarly, you can do this with any other number as well. Zero is the only number that actually has a property that forces one of the factors to be zero. Perhaps more, if you have 17 terms being multiplied, maybe three of them are zero, but not the others, but one of them must, must, must be zero. There's no choice. So anytime you're solving polynomial equations, the first thing you want to do is make sure that one side of the equation is equal to zero. In the nitro problems or in the homework or on assessments, almost certainly you're going to get problems that are not set equal to zero to begin with, like this uh, example one is. This one is already set equal to zero. So had this problem been 2x cubed minus 18x minus 12x squared equals negative 18x, you would first need to move the negative 18x to the left-hand side, set one side equal to zero, and then start doing what we're doing here. Having one side being zero is important and necessary because that's the only way we can invoke the zero product property. So how do we solve this equation? Well, we solve it by factoring. And this is literally the same thing we did in the last section. Now it's just adding an extra step to it. So we look at 2x cubed minus 12x squared plus 18x. First, we think, is there a GCF? And indeed, there's a GCF of two. All these numbers coefficients are even, so I can factor a two out for sure. And then I have x cubed, x squared, and a single x, so I can factor out an x as well. How do we know what goes inside? We divide each term by the GCF. So 2x cubed divided by 2x will give us x squared. Negative 12x squared divided by 2x will give us negative 6x. 18x divided by 2x gives us 9. Still have equal zero, and that's going to continue on until the end. 
This hopefully you recognize as a perfect square. It's the square of x minus 3. So that's why we still have GCF of 2x times the quantity x minus 3 times x minus 3 equals 0. Now is where we can invoke the zero product property because we have a product of three quantities. 2x is one, x minus three is another, x minus three is a third. So we are multiplying three things and getting zero as the answer. One of them has to be zero. I have no idea which one and it doesn't matter, in fact, to us which one it is. And instead of hedging our bets or taking a chance and being wrong, we set each of the factors equal to zero. So if we set 2x equal to zero, we can divide both sides by 2 and get x equals 0. Or we can set x minus 3 equal to 0, which is this factor. And if we add the 3 over to the other side, we'll get x equals 3. And then this is the same thing. I wrote it out for a reason. Uh, you'll see that very shortly. x minus 3 equals 0, again, gives us x equals 3. Here we have three roots, or three solutions, or three x-intercepts x equals 0, x equals 3, x equals uh, 3 as well, again. Star 1, the first thing I want you to do is pause the video here and check your answers. This is going to be a requirement anytime you solve an equation. It doesn't matter whether it's quadratic, radical, rational, it's immaterial. Anytime you solve an equation, you must check your answers to see if there are solutions or not. Meaning, take 0 and plug it into the original equation you were given. Never one that you came up with, because if there's a mistake along the way, you will only confirm that. So you take x equals 0 and you plug it into the original equation. If you get a true statement, then you know that this is a solution. I'm sure you've done this before with linear equations. I'm just asking you to do it again here. Then you take 3, plug it into the original equation. You should get 0 equals 0. If you don't, then x equals 3 is not a solution. Either that or you made a mistake and you need to backtrack your steps. And then star 2 is identify what the solutions are. So maybe x equals 0 does not work. Maybe only 3 works. Then x equals 3 would be the only solution. So check and then use the check in star 1 to determine what your solutions are in star 2. Now next, you, you probably previewed it from the example that was uh, chosen first. We have something called a repeated root or a solution or a repeated solution. This happens whenever a factor appears more than once. And if and when that happens, we call that a repeated root or a repeated solution. Reason why this is important is because it tells us the behavior of the shape of the graph. Even though we're doing algebra, the number of solutions that we get, and whether they're repeated solutions or not, tells us a, a whole great deal about what the shape of the graph is going to be or what the behavior is going to be uh, closer or farther away from infinity. So when a factor of x minus k is raised to an odd power, so maybe this had been, instead of x minus 3, the quantity squared, Maybe this had appeared three times, so then it would be x minus 3, the quantity to the third power. Whenever we have an odd power, and it doesn't have to be 3, it could be just to the first power, or uh, it could be to the third power, or fifth power, or seventh power. In all those cases, whenever the power is odd, the graph crosses the x-axis. By contrast, if the power is even, the graph touches or bounces off the x-axis. So it'll go back where it came from. It won't cross over. 